welcome to The Investing Show. I'm Simon Lambert and joining us here on the show today we have James Sim, Fund Manager Sim. for European Equities at Schroeder's and Richard Hunter of Wilson King. Simon. James, the um, world's been a low inflation world recently. We've had super low interest rates, um, we've had quantitative easing and what we've seen off the back of that is defensive companies, the ones that, that pay a big dividend, have been hugely popular mm -hmm. with investors. Absolutely. But there is an idea that there might be a, a reflation going on, that we might see the return of inflation. Mm -hmm. And rather helpfully, you've managed to explain this in the terms of something that I think we can all understand, the price of beer. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> what does the price of beer have to do with the potential for reflation in Europe and, and how that plays out for investors? So it's a very, I mean, it's a huge topic, Simon, obviously, and um, one that's debated from both angles by all the economists and sort of professional investors that, that I interact with. Um, I think one thing's pretty clear at this stage, and that's that the world is priced for deflation to continue. So if you look at some, it's not my area, but if you look at the bond market, you know, as, as, as you'll be aware, uh, bonds are, you know, priced extremely highly, they yield almost nothing in a lot of cases. And that's had an impact on the equity market. So anything in equities that looks a bit like a bond, because people can't get a return either in the bank or in, in bonds, they come to the equity market and they say, well, what, let's look around, what can I see that looks a bit like a bond? So companies like Nestle, Unilever, Diageo, AB InBev, to your beer point, and, and they've bought more and more of those shares and so the share prices have gone up. And so the companies have responded to that, okay, and then particularly in the beverage sector, they've put their prices up to try and justify these higher share prices. That's how I, I would see it. And in terms of those, those big companies and people being willing to pay mm. an ever higher price for them mm. and accept an ever lower dividend, because mm. many of these companies are the companies that people have relied on for many years mm. for, for dividends, they're happy to do that because they see very little growth anywhere else and mm. they look at these companies and they think well there's to, to, to use a phrase that was used quite heavily earlier this year mm -hmm. they're strong and stable mm -hmm. um, and they're going to keep paying mm -hmm. out a dividend and they'll just keep you know growing their customer mm -hmm. base but actually the problem is is that because they're finding growth so hard to come by they're, they're going out and they're splashing the cash on acquisitions and those acquisitions mm. might not actually be that beneficial to them that's right and the other thing of course is that once you've put your prices up and you're making a higher margin it attracts competition and I think that's one thing that I'm very wary of in these sort of well-loved sectors which are very highly priced so to, if we go back to beverages it doesn't it's not limited to that but but you've seen a huge number of startup brands so, you know, if you go into a pub now in London or anywhere else across the country, you know, that you've got your staple Carlsberg, Heineken and, and Stella Artois. Mm -hmm. You've probably got five or six beers you've never heard of. And those guys were all startups a few years ago. So we think of Brewdog, Meantime Brewery, um, Camden Town, you know, around here. Mm -hmm. And so that has meant that these companies have had to buy those companies back, effectively buying the sales that they would have lost. Mm -hmm. Is it, the other great example that I, I've been using recently is Dollar Shave Club, uh, which is a US phenomenon. So, you know, we, there was a business model invented called razors and razor blades because you sold the razor and then people have to buy the razor blade to fit on it. But they pushed that so far, did Gillette and Wilkinson saw, that now companies have started doing mail order razor blades. You know, there's all sorts of categories like that where basically the companies have pushed their margins too high and I think partly as a function of some of the big picture stuff you talked about, and that's now coming back to bite them in terms of the returns they're making. So I, as an investor, and as my clients are being asked to pay the highest ever price for those sort of companies, just at the point where the fundamentals have never been so bad and they're, they're you know, unable to grow. So I'm really warning people off that kind of area. And is this something that you, you think we can see throughout the that sort of consumer staples, consumer brands yeah, right. sector in that it's not just drinks, there's, we can think of food as well. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, I can't think of another time that I can remember quite so many new food brands, mm. sort of the, almost like you could describe as kind of craft food stuff yeah. coming to the market, yeah. whether that's energy bars or people who want to sell you um, yeah. ready meals or things mm. like that. Um, right through to what we would expect to be more expensive, mm -hmm. the sort of higher-end food mm -hmm. stuff. But there's huge numbers of those new mm -hmm. companies coming out, presumably to, to eat 
eat the lunch of the bigger companies. Yeah. Um, so if we're not looking at those sectors, where do you think does look good? Mm. Well, what I, I've been sort of encouraging people to do is to think about if inflation starts to come back, and I think we can come on to why, but if it starts to come back, have they got things in their portfolios that will protect them against that? Mm. And I think a lot of people don't because they've got some bonds They've got a bit of cash because they're a bit worried about the, you know, the level of markets. And then when they buy equities, they buy these very high quality companies that we just, which basically benefit from low inflation and low bond yields. So I've been sort of trying to steer people into sectors like the banks, unfashionable, mm. underloved, but quite cheap for what they are and probably better than they were 10 years ago. Um, other financials like insurance companies, I think, will do reasonably well. And probably the most controversial one that I own in my portfolio is actually the telco sector, mm. which is hitting all-time relative lows. Um, and I think I'm starting to see some sort of signs of life there in terms of the sort of things um, going on, in terms of bringing down the cost of the business, improving the profit margins off a low valuation. So by all means, want to own good quality companies, just think about what price you're paying for it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I mean, in terms of the telecoms, presumably one of the reasons it, in, in your valuation they're hitting lows at the moment is because they've kind of already been through mm. the scenario you just described, which was intense competition, yeah, uh, a, pr a right. proliferation of, of And the rivals, regulator, of course, which is And, of course, the regulator. And, and maybe even to some extent um, banks have their own intense competition, mm. not more from a global mm. perspective mm -hmm. but rather than a, a by-product mm. by perspective. Um, I just wonder whether or at what point you can differentiate um, between where competition is hurting mm. and where it's existing, because it mm. exists everywhere. I mean, yeah, the, the supermarkets right. famously over the, over the years have been mm. a fiercely competitive sector, uh, and we've had the, the new entrants, the likes of Aldi and Lidl, yeah. etc. I wonder where you make the differentiation between um, where it's almost product related yeah. um, and it's part of the caution in terms of the sector they operate in. Well, so what, when I say banks, of course, I'm investing in Europe. So I can go and choose those countries that have a banking system that maybe isn't quite as competitive as we have here in the UK. So one good example of that would be in the Nordic area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a company I very much like called Danske Bank, Danish obviously, a name like that. And uh, the Danish market's quite well sewn up and they're sort of the challenger in Sweden and Norway. But these are not very competitive markets. And as a result, the returns they make you know, would grace any anybody's book in terms of a good quality company and um, same as Belgium so I own KBC which is you know the local Belgian bank has a very big market share and so it's got a bit more pricing power so you have to w when it comes to Europe it's such a diverse interesting culturally yeah. different continent it's very difficult just to sort of say well this is what it's like you have to really sort of dig deep, and I guess that's my job is to go and find those opportunities. So, so in term, that's interesting. In terms of your metrics, then, mm. um, are there any or how many UK companies make the grade? The one sort of big area that you could make a sort of big top down call on today, it, all across Europe actually, is the UK consumer. So anything consumer related in the UK has been absolutely taken out and shot in terms of valuations. So all these kind of domestic general retailers, companies like Next, Marks and Spencers, Debenhams, we all talk about Amazon, but what is there a space for these guys? Because they currently trade on metrics like five times earnings or 7% dividend yield. So very cheap. Now we know the UK consumer is in a tough place. We know that. But, but our job is to think what's already priced into the market and is it going to be actually probably less bad. So if you had to push me, that would be the one area of the UK that I'm starting to look at. We haven't taken the plunge yet, but that's the area that I think looks most interesting. And in terms of when you go looking for companies, mm. do you go looking for companies from a sort of company specific mm -hmm. right you know perspective mm -hmm. do you do you screen for those companies mm -hmm. do you look at the bigger picture and then mm -hmm. try and dive down into them mm. and how much emphasis do you you place on value because you've spoken mm. quite a bit yeah. about the value of those companies what's, what's your sort of method there so it's a bit unfashionable but valuation is kind of at the heart of everything i i do now just going in and buying a company because it's cheap i mean in europe that's a fool's errand you know, there's a lot of good reasons why some of these companies are cheap. Some quite often corporate governance, sometimes the politics. Um, but if you're prepared to get on a plane, go and visit a business, 
spend a bit of time walking around the factory with the CEO, um, talking to the other people in the company below that top level, you can find these diamonds in the rough. And I'm only looking for maybe 10 or 15 a year. So these are companies we want to own for maybe two, three, four years. And we've found them all over Europe, some in Spain, some in Germany, some in wherever, quite agnostic. And then when it comes down to it, we then build a portfolio of these different opportunities. But it's a portfolio that I want to hang together. So your question, how much do you think about the bigger picture things, some of the macroeconomics? I do think about those because I want all the, the companies to move in the way that I think the world is going. And as I say, I think inflation is one area that's massively underestimated and underpriced in the market today. And so that's a lot of the companies I own will benefit from higher inflation. So it's a combination of the two, to be honest, Simon. Why do you think the inflation is going to come back? And uh, presumably, mm. actually, you don't necessarily mean, mm. when we think of high inflation, mm. we think of, you know, inflation 6, 7, 8%, mm. even mm. higher. Mm. But presumably, you don't necessarily mean that. It's just slightly higher than yeah. not a lot of inflation at all. Well, the, the nice thing for me is I don't have to make that bet yet, yeah. right? Because we're so low, and bond yields are so low across Europe. Um, before I answer that, I make one question. No one knows the answer. One quick point. No one knows. And any fund manager or any sort of professional economist who comes and tells you this is what's going to happen, they don't actually know. Because you, in two minutes you'll be able to find another professional forecaster who'll tell you something totally different. So no one knows. But what I know is that a low inflation, almost a deflationary world, is already priced in. So the odds of me winning by betting on higher inflation, if you like, are hugely in my favour because stocks like AB InBev and Nestle and some of the sectors you mentioned are priced extremely highly and bond yields are priced very, very tight. And those companies that benefit from inflation, like banks, and, and have suffered because of these low bond yields, they're really cheap. So I know that I've got the odds in my favour, but I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. But, but you asked me a direct question, didn't you, which was, how, why do I think it yeah. is coming back? And, and I'll give you, make two points. Firstly, I meet 500 companies a year, and not a single one of those companies tells me that wages are going down next year, over, on this year. And in fact, more and more of them are telling me they're finding, they're finding it increasingly tough to find the staff. So that tells me the labour market is quite tight. So that's the first point. And the second thing is, and I can see this in some of the sort of top-down charts as well, the factories in Europe, so the capital base, so there's two halves of an economy, labour and capital, the capital base is getting increasingly tight. Okay, so it's increasingly difficult. Companies, their factories are filling up. And so they're going to start putting their prices up because that's the only thing you can do. And so for those two reasons is why I think inflation is coming back. But the, the key point really is the odds are massively in my favour. Mm -hmm. And one final thing I wanted mm. to ask you before we run out of time was about the sort of the concept of Europe, obviously, is, is one of the interesting things is you're invest investing across a region mm. where any company can move from one country and go do business in the other one mm -hmm. um, within the EU. Mm. Um, See where this question's going. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> and actually it's not a question about Brexit. The question is, is how much do you see companies that are doing very, very well in one sector, in perhaps in their, own, in their mm. home country or mm. in the neighbouring country, mm -hmm. then look at a similar sector, perhaps, in another part of Europe mm. that is much less developed and think, oh, actually, we could go over there and we could make some money. Mm. You do see it. But I, let's not underestimate the, some of the cultural and the language barriers. We, we think it's one big, happy EU, European party. It's not. And, you know, I've seen quite a few, a number of companies try and do that and, and fail. So, for example, if you're a German buyer of insurance, we're very used in the UK to going online and doing it online. They, not only do they want to call and speak to someone, they actually want to walk down the high street and go in, into an insurance broker and sit down and have a discussion. So, so the thing that your average Briton would actively avoid at all possible costs. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> right. So, so you get these big differences and I think it, it, it's not quite as easy. But Europe is a hugely diverse continent. It's got some amazing companies 
Um, and actually they've, they've improved their position in the world a lot over the last five years and I still think it's a reasonably interesting place to invest. Also, there seems to be, um, if, if we assume that the US is somewhere mid to late cycle in terms of its yeah. recovery and that Europe is, is also part of this synchronised recovery mm -hmm. but a bit behind, um, do you see um, a bit of a tailwind coming next year potentially in, in 2018 for the European economy as a whole? The European economy is absolutely fine next year. Um, you know, actually, I think the, the risk is more that you get a surprise on the upside. Uh, of course, you could always get a crisis, a political crisis, uh, to derail things. But as I sit here today, I think the risk is really that you start to get a big capex investment cycle through Europe, which has happened in the US, actually. Mm -hmm. So the growth rate's not been huge, but they have been investing, you know, building new factories, that kind of thing. We haven't had that in Europe. And if that starts to come back, and the reason I think it comes back is because, as I said before, there's many sort of factories that are pretty full in Europe now. So if that sort of capital investment starts to come back, both public and private sector, that's where you'll get the, the growth surprise. Now, is that already priced into the market? Who knows? Um, but we're still able to find some reasonable opportunities from a sort of bottom-up perspective. Mm. Uh, and anecdotally, of course, there, there's... Um ongoing speculation that the, a lot of US professional investors are aching um, to put their money into mm. Europe as well, which obviously will be positive for, mm -hmm. for markets. They're mm -hmm. just waiting for a little bit more mm. of a, a sort of s sustained recovery before mm. they mm. they potentially come in as well. But, but of course, you kind of have to pre-position, don't you? Because mm. by the time you know that you've got a solid sustained recovery, yep. it's kind of already... Pri the market's a forward-looking mechanism. Sure. So we just need to take a view a few years out and, and, and position ahead of that, and that, that's what I try and do. Thank you very much. The, the case for optimism, I always <laughs> like that. That's all we've got time for, but we should definitely end on an optimistic note. James, thank you. Thanks, Richard, Simon. thank Pleasure. you. And thank you very much for watching. Join us next time on The Investing Show. Goodbye.